Okay, good to see everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a, a full morning today and uh, with really interesting voices uh, and different perspectives. And we think it will be uh, very interesting. Uh, so I'll ask, I'm Nancy Schley, by the way, I'm the Associate Director of Field Education here in New Brunswick, and uh, I work with study abroad programming, and uh, this is really uh, uh, one of my main interests, so I'm so glad that everyone is here. So I'll ask every, everyone will be muted during the presentations. We have four presentations uh, and then uh, we will open it up for discussion uh, once the presentations are completed. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Lamar, our executive director, and he'll say a few words. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Mark Lamar, Executive Director of Field Education, uh, Associate Professor of Practice, and I have the good fortune to work with colleagues like uh, Professors Nancy Schley and Rebecca Davis, who will then introduce uh, other colleagues in our uh, Voices from the Field program this morning. We've been doing this now since 2020, and we, uh, we appear on Wednesday mornings a couple of times a semester with relevant, powerful topics. This is one of them. We're so happy to have uh, people here today and folks from far away and nearby looking forward to a good morning. So a uh, thank you for putting us on your itinerary today. And I'll turn it right back to Nancy and uh, uh, Professor Davis, and uh, we'll get on with our morning. Great to see everyone. Great. Thanks so much. So uh, our first speaker is Rebecca Avera, and she is the program coordinator uh, for our study abroad program in Israel. She's on the ground in Israel. She uh, works with uh, an organization called Yahel uh, and that uh, coordinates the internships for our study abroad program in Israel. And she has a very unique voice uh, and experience that I know you're going to really uh, get a lot uh, from hearing about. So I'll turn it over to you, Rebecca. Uh, good morning, everyone. Here it's evening, so for me it's almost nighttime. I'm happy to even, you know, talk to you online. I know it's a, a bit different. Um, I would like to share my screen so you will see my presentation. Um, okay, just a second. Okay. Can you hear it? Can you see it? Switch computers. Just a second. Okay, so. Um, my name is Rebecca Vera, like Nancy said. Um, uh, 36 years old, and I was born and raised in Israel. And when Nancy said I have a unique story, it's regarding the question of immigration to Israel. And I, I think it's affect uh, all people in the world because immigration, it's a big topic. Um, I will go and start with my family story um, and give you a, a bit of a taste of how it used to be for the Jewish Ethiopian community back in Ethiopia. So as growing up here in Israel, um, I used to live and hear my mom sharing her story every day. Um, you can hear a story of the most simple life you can imagine. The Jewish community in Ethiopia used to live uh, together as a community in villages. As you see in the picture, this is kind of the house they had from not even a stone. They used to sleep on the ground, to cook on the ground, to take a shower in the river. They had no watch. Those who had shoes, that was amazing for them. My mom, who went to school, even to go to school was a privilege 
uh, I mean, in terms of most of them, you know, were farmers or they did the handwork, but those who went to school, it, it was considered something. So my mom used to walk to school every day, uh, half a day without shoes. Just think and imagine that. Um, the story of this community unique because even though they had some anti-Semitic uh, incidents in the villages, they used to keep their tradition and their Jewish life. So sometimes the outside looked and appeared like others, but in their houses, they used to keep the traditions um, and all the meaning of it. Um, they had their religious leaders. We call them Kessim, it's like a rabbi. And they led the community. The funny part about it is that they thought they are the only Jews in the world. Since they were, they were disconnected from the rest of the world. They didn't know there are Jews, there are other Jews in the world. Um, so most of them used to live like they had like simple life you can imagine and, and not even know what's going on in other parts in the world. Um, when my mom, she's the youngest out of eight, one day when a dictatorship got into power in Ethiopia, his name was Mengistu Haile Mariam. And actually his name is, um, we don't say it at home because what he did to the Jewish community, it was a dictatorship that killed a lot of people. One of the days my, my uncle, my mom's oldest brother, uh, he was protesting against him and he was a student and he was killed by this government. My grandma got his t-shirt covered with blood. They not, never found him, his body, they never had a funeral. And, you know, just to say goodbye. That's when the Jewish community realized that they cannot stay there anymore. They need to go back home. And what is home for them? For them, it was Jerusalem. They didn't know the state of Israel. They knew Jerusalem is written in the Bible. Jerusalem with golden rivers, honey and milk. They were so innocent that this is what they thought they're gonna find. So I kept asking my mom, what did you think that you read something and this is something real? So my mom decided to leave begging her parents. And on during 1984, Okay, my computer is making me problems. Just a second. Sorry for that. Okay, so on 1984, that was the first operation of the massive groups of the Jewish Ethiopian community that uh, came to Israel. So according to my mom, she begged her parents to leave. So she left only with her brother and cousin to the unknown. In the middle of the night, people told her, take a little bit of water, a little bit of food, leave everything behind. We're going to Jerusalem, like they read in the, the Bible. So she le left, she left crying and, and walking. And what does it mean when you have no watch and you have no map and you have no technology to walk to the unknown, to a place that you never seen? You, you didn't even have a picture, just imagine that. They walk through the desert of Sudan. Um, in, on, in this way, they had burgers on the way, women got raped, um, those who gave birth they had to keep their babies quiet so the burghers won't hear them. 4,000 people of my community died on this way. Some families left 10 people, only one arrived to Israel, maybe two. So this is a tragedy to our community. My mom arrived to Sudan 
to a refugee camp, a country that had no relationship with the, uh, the Israeli government, and they needed to hide the fact that they're Jews again. Um, but in the middle of the night, uh, the Israeli government decided to bring the black Jews back home. In the middle of the night, airlifts, airplanes landed in the refugee camp in a secret operation that we call it Operation Moses. The people who were there, including my mom, described the big white bird. The big white, white bird was the airplane because they never saw an airplane. They were scared and running back, but they managed to do it. For them, it was also the first time when they got to, to, to the airport in Israel, they kissed the ground because that was the dream of many, many generations, including her uncle that died. That was also the first time they saw white people or white Jews. They thought they were alone. So my, like all the kids ran back to their parents, they got scared. They didn't understand what's going on. So for them, it was difficult, but I will move forward um, and tell you what it's like to be a first generation here. It is challenging. My mom, she got married here in Israel and all of my siblings, including me, we were born here, but we had to carry so much. We had to carry all the integration of our parents, the language, everything. Growing up for me was to be the only black person from kindergarten till 12th grade in my classes everywhere. And this is something that is difficult because kids can be sometimes mean. A strong person don't let people affect him. My mom taught me all the time and I always looked at her after the, this incredible journey she did just because of her dream to the Jerusalem, to the unknown. I said to myself, who am I to be, be weak, right? So I decided that I'm gonna win everybody. I'm gonna do my studies and I'm gonna be better than them. But Growing up like that, for me, it was embarrassment because I didn't want people to see my culture. I was embarrassed. I tried to integrate. But soon I realized that my skin color is my DNA. And no matter how much I would try to be part of the Israeli society, part of the majority, I'm, not, I'm always going to look different. And the moment I accept that, I think that helped me to become, who, to become who I am today. So as Rebecca, I am, I am the first one in my family to graduate from, from academia. I have a bachelor degree in diplomacy and conflict studies. And when I was young, I had a tutor, an American tutor that I don't remember her name, she taught me English. It was over 20 something years ago. I do remember this lady. She came to volunteer and she helped me to be understanding this language. And this has influenced me to do my master degree, all of it in English. I do remember her. She was there for a short time, but the influential was too big for me to do what I, what I did. So I did my master's degree also in Israel. And I was as a Jewish agency emissary at Stanford University for one year and then two years in Las Vegas. And I had my speech all over the world almost. I was in over 30 campuses around the US. I was in South Africa, England. I traveled a lot because for me, I'm not embarrassed anymore in my culture. I'm not embarrassed anymore in my mom's story. It's my obligation to share it with people. 
because who else is gonna share it if not us? But it doesn't leave us as a minority without challenges. Like I said, we are a small community here in Israel. We are less than 2%. And it means also a lot. We, are, we do face in uh, police brutality. We face in racism, discrimination. It can be in every aspect in life, from education to job opportunities. And sometimes when they hear me on the phone, when I apply to a job, Oh, wow, they're getting excited. But once I get there, you can see the face. Because they said, oh, you didn't have an accent on the phone. But I was born here. People forget that we have some generations that we're Israeli as well. So I, most of my activism, I do try to educate others. Because this kind of challenges happening all over the world. Police brutality, discrimination, nicknames. I wish we can change it. And this is why I'm doing my job. <laughs> this is why I work for Yahel. Um, Yahel uh, is seeking to bring students to do the same. Remember that tutor that I was speaking about. So I'm telling everybody who's coming to do our programs, you think you're coming here for a short, per short time, but for this one kid, at least in my community, Ethiopian kid, he will remember you for life. This is what happened to me. So we have long, long-term programs uh, at Yahel, which is nine month uh, programs. And we have a short programs that one of, uh, one of them is the Rutgers uh, in Rishon Lezion in the, in the center. Nancy, I believe you will give them more information, but uh, I wanna give you some information about what do you actually do in our programs. So you do go and volunteer with population that usually people don't see, don't talk about. We have it everywhere, right? But the influential that you are, this is the powerful thing about it because I'm a living example for that. So social change and community building, this is what I believe in. And I hope you guys will be part of our programs because you can be something that will change this kid life or each kid. I encourage you to scan this. Uh, Nancy, you have it as well. Um, and look, look into it and read about our programs. If you have any questions, uh, Nancy, you, you can feel free to email, give them my email. Um, and yeah, uh, if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Rebecca. What, what a powerful talk, really a powerful story. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, about your family and about your experience. Really very powerful and the long lasting influence that others had on you, including that tutor who was there for a short time with you. That's really very powerful. Thank you, Nancy. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Davis. Rebecca Davis is the director of our global programs and she heads uh, the Romania program, and Mexico program, and does a lot, has a lot of other global initiatives. So I'll turn it over to you, Becky, thanks. Okay, thank you, whoops, yep. Um, so um, thank you, Rebecca, that, that's a nice, um, um, that, that parallels with what I'm gonna talk about because today it's really about 
trying to amplify the voices of those who are often not heard um, and, and getting those voices heard in different places. So um, let me um, share my screen. So Janice and I are going to talk about um, amplifying the voices of girls um, from a global perspective. Sorry, just a minute. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, Janice Rogers um, is an MSW research assistant. So she's going to, I'm going to present a few slides and then she's going to take over. So um, my focus is on uh, empowering the girl child. And we're going to uh, talk about a curriculum that, that uh, we're working on. So for me, I'm presenting on the advocacy work that I'm doing at the United Nations as a representative of the International Association of Schools of Social Work. Now, the UN is made up of member states, so governments, basically, and UN organizations like um, UNICEF, UN Women. Um, and so one of the things that the UN does in order to hear the voices of citizens um, and organizations that are working on the ground is different organizations, we call them non-governmental organizations or NGOs, can um, get consultative status with the UN. Um, and what that means is that we, um, we serve on different committees. Um, and I work with six other people who are representatives of the U of IASSW as well. And so IASSW represents globally all the schools of social work and educators. Um, and so we serve on different committees such as family migration, mental health and social development. Um, and our work is really focused on achieving the um, global goals, 17 global goals. And these are, these represent the 30 human rights obligations that are then translated into local action. So one of the things we talk about is all global is local. Things have to happen at, um, at the local level. Um, and so my work is um, uh, focused more on women and girls. Um, and so if you look at the one of the targets, SDG target, five to 5.2.1, it's to eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls um, in public and private spaces. And that includes things like trafficking, sexual exploitation. And this seems like a lofty goal, but that's one of the things that uh, we're working on, that Janice and I are working on together. And it's one step at the time. And she'll go into some of the details. Um, why girls? Um, well, we've got about 1.2 billion adolescents, 10 to 19, uh, across the globe. About half of these are girls, and most live in low and middle income countries. Um, and so basically, empowering the girl child represents an unprecedented um, opportunity for global progress. Because if you invest in girls, um, then there are many returns, like things that social workers work on, reduction in early pregnancy, increased earning power, and basically overall um, health and well-being for families and communities. And we know that girls' reproductive and sexual rights are highly controversial, as is uh, the, the girls' education in some places as well. Um, so how do I do this? Um, with such big goals, I represent IASSW on this committee. It's called the Working Group on Girls, and it's an NGO committee, a non-governmental organization committee that works for girls and with girls. So we engage with girls across the globe 
um, that are in, engaged in different activities with different organizations, ages 10 to 19. We also support the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. And this is the global agenda for empowerment of all women and girls worldwide. Now, these are things that you can Google and look up and learn about um, because it also impacts um, the US as well, uh, which Janice will talk some about. One of the things we sponsor is the International Day of the Girl Child, October 11th every year. Again, you can participate in this. We have many activities that are virtual now because of COVID. Um, and so it's really opened up opportunities for us to engage and hear girls' voices um, from, across, uh, from across the globe. Um, so um, one of the things that, um, you know, you, in order to address big goals, it's like if you're working with a client, we have to partialize the problem and we have to look at where can we start? What are the entry points? And so Janice and I have been working on a curriculum on empowering the girl child, because we feel if we, if we help build capacity with social workers and awareness to work specifically with some of the problems that girls face uh, locally and globally, then this is a way to get girls' voices uh, heard and achieve the SDGs. Um, so I'm going to um, turn it over to um, Janice. Let me pull up and then she's going to talk about the curriculum. Um, and Janice is an MSW student. Um, that we've been working together, what, almost three years now, right? Yeah, it's been, been a few years, yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, and thank you everyone for your time and attention and Rebecca for your beautiful, amazing story that you shared with us. Um, so my, I wanna talk a little bit about some of what Dr. Davis and I have been working on. And again, I'm in my last year of my MSW um, and I've been working as Dr. Davis's research assistant, assistant in the Office of Global Social Work Programs. Um, and the intent behind this curriculum is really to provide more education to social workers on the challenges that girls experience um, with a global scope. So next slide, please. Okay, so Dr. Davis talked a little bit about why this is important and why this is important, particularly for social workers. So I think sometimes that we think girls' rights issues are more of um, not happening in the US. And I think that's something that is important for social workers to be aware of the interconnectedness of local and global problems and issues. Um, and also, Dr. Davis talked about the sustainable development goals, particularly sustainable development goal number five, gender equality, um, and just the value of empowering girls, ensuring they're provided with quality education, employable skills, and ultimately to be free from rights violations, such as gender-based violence and child marriage. And I think this is a particularly important um, for social workers because we abide by a code of ethics. One of my favorite values that we stand by as social workers is the dignity and worth of the person. Um, and I think that especially in the post-COVID environment in my research, I found that girls around the world are at risk of profound setbacks unless action is taken. Um, and I think this is a, a critically important issue for social workers to be aware of. And again, in my research, I saw how many social problems were really rooted in the inequities girls experience in so many aspects of our lives. And if we're able to empower girls and raise their status and abilities to be educated, um, we can change so much. And again, it seems like such a lofty goal, but I think there's a lot behind it. Next slide, please. Okay, and so just very briefly, what are some of the challenges that girls face? Um, education is really critical to girls' empowerment. 
um, but there's a lot, lot of barriers to that. And so you'll see a list of that here from some recent research. Um, and it's everything from community, it's poor policy, legal environment, um, child marriage, adolescent pregnancy. Um, and when I talk about education, it's not just the ability to go to school, it's everything like mentorship, skill building, self-efficacy and confidence. Those are all things that girls need to succeed. Next slide. Okay. okay, so what specifically do social workers need to know about girls? So we've developed a, a course content with a series of modules focused on things like the sustainable development goals, and international child rights legislation, just to have a foundation of, of what's out there. Um, the modules will look at things like child marriage and different organizations such as Girls Not Brides that have international initiatives to try to end child marriage. We'll look at forms of gender-based violence such as female genital mutilation. Um, we'll focus on issues around reproductive health, menstrual justice and health, so you'll see um, an image there of a really fabulous documentary called Period End of Sentence. And there's an organization called the PAD Project, which focuses on menstrual justice issues, both domestically in the US and internationally as well. So students will learn about the efforts of a variety of different organizations um, and their efforts to empower girls. And I think one thing that I didn't include in this curriculum that I would like to is a focus on disability in girls. Next slide. Okay, so just a closer look at one of the modules with the curriculum um, that we're developing is a look at child marriage. Um, students will learn why child marriage is one of the biggest impediments to girls' educational attainment. And again, I want social workers to see both the global and local nature of these issues. And I think it's so important because of, of all of the different environments that social workers will be working in and the people that they will encounter and having the knowledge about this is so valuable. So we'll look about the we'll look at the efforts of an organization called Unchained at Last, which is actually a, a New Jersey based nonprofit that works on ending child marriage in the US and trying to change legislation to also support ending child marriage because there's some shocking um, you know, different laws and states that actually allow child marriage to happen in the US. Um, and so one of the activities students will do is to create a mind map to visualize what their goals are, what they need to access their goals and what girls' rights mean to them. Okay, next slide. I think that might be the last. Yeah, um, that was it. So yeah, thank you for your attention. Um, and I think that that's some of our initial thinking behind developing this curriculum and, and really trying to edu educate future social workers on girls' rights and empowerment. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Becky and Janice. Excellent, really great initiatives. Did you have something to add, Becky, there? I was just going to just um, just add in terms of the, the, um, the study abroad programs um, that um, for the, including um, Israel, uh, you work in the communities and um, working with um, these organizations that provide these same, the very similar services like we do after school programs um, that are focused on these very, very similar issues. Um, so just, I just wanted to um, recognize that. Great, great, excellent. You, the, your work has really blossomed. Uh, it's really taken off. So uh, we, we, we are always interested in hearing what you're doing. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce Miladi Marillo, who is our Associate Director at the Institute for Families here at the School of Social Work. 
And uh, Milady also uh, co-leads the uh, Mexico program, the Mexico Study Abroad program during winter session and has a lot of training and uh, direct practice experience. I'll turn it over to you, Milady. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you, Janice and uh, uh, Becky for that. Um, that information about the programs, because I think what I'm going to talk about is a great segue to curriculum development. Um, as Nancy said, I'm Miladi Murillo, and I'm the Associate Director for the Institute for Families. Um, the Institute for Families is part of Rutgers School of Social Work. And what I'll talk to you about today is a little bit uh, about some work that's happening in New Jersey. Um, but before I dive in, I'm going to share um, a screen. Hopefully you can see that. Perfect. So mine is not as fancy as everybody in PowerPoints, but I do have this flyer that will walk us um, throughout our conversation. And before I dive in into some of the work that I'm part of, I do want to share um, the mission of the Institute for Families because it'll create a, a framework around what I'll be talking about. Um, and the mission of our institute is to support and strengthen individuals, families, and communities by building the capacity of human service professionals in organizations. And we do this uh, several ways. We do this by increasing capacity to meet best practices and standards and respond to the changes and needs of our communities. Uh, we disseminate uh, knowledge and lead to greater understanding of social issues with everybody that we work with. And then we develop leaderships and research um, as well as professional development for families, um, communities, and organizations. And we, anything that we do, we try to share that nationally and also sometimes with you know, other countries when possible. So now that you kind of understand a little bit about our, um, the Institute and what we do, I'm gonna talk to you about the, child, the New Jersey Child Welfare Training Partnership. It is a partnership that was established in 2007, and it is a collaboration between the New Jersey Department of Children and Families um, and our institute. The initiative provides training and education for approximately 5,000 child and family serving professionals, and specifically it's um, New Jersey State's child welfare workers. So CPMP or formerly known DC uh, DIFIS workers, and the purpose is to develop their knowledge and skills supporting the safety, child well-being, and health of children and youth and their caregivers. So how do how does that happen? Right. Um, it, it it actually might seem very simple because it's more about pro, um, developing a product or developing training, but training needs to have, it, it's a science, and we definitely go deep into that science because we're talking about individuals and professionals who are serving families, thousands of families in New Jersey. Um, so in collaboration with our partners at DCF, we start off with a needs assessment, and really that may look a little different depending on the goal, um, but it really is to define what's the needs for the worker. What is it that the workers or the skills that the workers are need in order to do the work that they have to do to keep children and families safe? Um, we do this by, by having like a national scan, looking for best practices, what other states, what other countries are doing in their child welfare system. And that's just part of the component, it's research. Um, we also uh, work with the um, team members and staff in the department to ask questions. We host um, informational sessions, we um, create surveys. So gather what's important, what's out there, what has worked, and what is it that we need in order to form a goal and form a really concrete um, document that allows us to understand where we need to head. Once we do, once we work on that needs assessment, um, 
Then we jump to developing a product. And I say product because sometimes there might be a skill that a worker needs and training doesn't necessarily um, cover that. So it could be uh, designing uh, an asynchronous course. It could be designing a synchronous course. We think about whether this product needs to be in person. It needs, um, does it need to be a flyer? Is it just um, information that needs to be shared? So that development of the product takes multiple layers. Um, the first part is really building the goals, the objectives, and then framing an outline to ensure that those skills and everything that we learned in the needs assessment is really incorporating it into um, that, that section. Once we have a product, we then jump into implementation. And that's where we're actually uh, trying it out. It doesn't mean that it's finalized. It's kind of like a, let's see if this, what we envisioned, what the needs, what we talked about, what we envisioned in the product um, really works. So there is a train the trainer where we have um, someone actually share or walk through the product as how it should be implemented. Um, we have a pilot with um, participants who will provide some feedback to us and then we launch it. And so all of this implementation process can actually go back to if if we go into the implementation process, we have a pilot and we realize, oh, this product really is too long or the product actually needs more time. It kind of goes back to the development stage or it might go back to a needs assessment to just gather more information. So while we might be really close to finalizing a product, it can always go back into any of the stages um, to ensure that we're really finalizing and completing a product that's really helpful. Malati, then, can I interrupt just one quickly? Can you um, make that any bigger? Several in the chat were asking. Oh, sure. It shows very large in my, is that better? Yeah, I think that's better. We, and we can all, we can always I'll send it in the chat too. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's sorry. I just was seeing the messages. Oh, I didn't see that. Thank you. And then the last part is really um, evaluation. And so once we act, we launch the product, uh, we have a pre-test, a post-test. And what we're really doing is measuring satisfaction and knowledge gained um, from the participants. And we're also uh, assessing the overall experience because we wanna get feedback not only from the participants, but those who are delivering the content. Um, it's so important to really always um, go through that process because you learn a lot from your um, participants. Sometimes you actually understand that they're getting what's needed, but then sometimes when it's implemented, you realize, oh, this is not hitting the mark. Um, so, we we do this in order to make sure that no changes are needed. And if we find that there are, then we again go and kind of tweak the product um, to be able to, to enhance or, or get to the skills that the, the department is looking for for their workers. This scene, it is a lengthy process. And when I talk about the training and professional development that we offer our child welfare workers, it's extensive. It's about 5,000 workers across the state. And we have between 30, 40, maybe 50 courses um, that topics range from human trafficking or substance use or engaging with families with mental health, um, child development. So it really ranges in, in the work or the content that we offer because we're really building seeds for these workers. Some of these workers are walking into the department and they need to understand or get enough skills and knowledge to be able to do the work that they have to do from the beginning. But then there are other workers who have been in the system for a long time and we want to build on those skills or change habits that have not necessarily been successful in, in the work that they're doing with their families. 
So it is a constant, um, you know, just evaluating what works or um, isn't working to ensure everybody has, has the information. And then that doesn't end there. Once we have products, one of the things that we always try to do is share our experiences with others. Um, so we do this with other states. We do this um, with our, our actual experience with Mexico. We've um, been able to share some of the work that we've done when we've um, gone to the to to the study abroad the study abroad program in Mexico. Some of their child welfare workers also are in need of um, sort of professional development. And, and we've had the, the privilege of working with one of the universities there and providing um, a workshop. So it is something that we constantly uh, look to collaborate across um, in order to share that knowledge um, and then also try to um, get that knowledge from other jurisdictions across the country. So I think that's pretty much um, in general, some of the work that we do. And while th um, the focus is New Jersey, it is a, a global um, experience because all of this process and education and professional development is happening and is a need everywhere um, in order to, to really support the families and children of their communities. So that's, that's all for, um, for, my, for my presentation. Thank you. Um, I'll just add um, that because um, I, th I think the, the 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 key thing is that we can discuss local problems and um, but one of the things we talk about in the the global social work course is that we share the same problems across the globe. Um, and Melody, we were in Mexico in January, and we um, they have they're in the middle of their child welfare reforms. And so one of the things we spent time uh, with was the um, their their equivalent child protection agency as to our Department of Children and Families, and um, the the um, training was a huge a huge issue. Uh, in terms of capacity development. So that's one of the things we're we're looking at doing more collaboration with. So Nancy, do you wanna take over or should we open it up for? I think she's having trouble. Okay, so let's open it up. Um, thank you, everybody um, else also that is presented and Rebecca. Um, and so we can open it up. Oh, there, now now you can speak, Nancy. Yeah, now I can talk. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I, I was having some Wi-Fi difficulty. I was in and out. So uh, <laughs> now I can talk. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you so much, Melody. That's so impressive. Uh, even uh, being here at the School of Social Work, I really didn't appreciate all the, the far reach you have in terms of the trainings that you do and really how that impacts our entire child welfare system. Really excellent. So let's open it up to questions and comments. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, anything profound. We're we're really looking to hear your voices, what your comments are, questions. And if there are questions about uh, about the study abroad programs, uh, both Israel and um, Israel and Romania coming up this summer. Um, other ways you can get involved, uh, feel free to, to ask questions. And you can unmute to ask your questions. Um, yes, you can unmute yourself.
Hi, um, I just wanted to comment. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm a first year grad student on uh, the social work program. Um, I also applied and actually have a meeting with uh, Mrs. Davis on Friday, uh, just to discuss my application uh, for Romania. Um, and I just want to comment that uh, I really appreciate appreciate everyone sharing um, their story. I was very touched, especially by uh, the first Rebecca that spoke. <laughs> um and just kind of i think that's really what sparked my interest in the study abroad program as well um because being a woman myself and um just kind of we are an oppressed and vulnerable population um and it really speaks to really what i want to do in this field especially just working with children and thinking about my second year uh field placement um and even now, just at the field placement I'm at, uh, NAMI, New Jersey, um, and kind of being able to, the project I'm working on is a resource and referral directory that they want to put in place for just all of New Jersey to be able to use uh, for people who call into the helpline. Um, and as I am going through uh, different resources, um, I'm finding the importance of the resources for women and children, especially, um, and how that can be geared towards, you know, uh, the vulnerable, like as a woman in the populations that are needed, uh, their assistance and how we can help uh, being at a macro level organization and how our resources can be very geared towards those specific populations that need help. Um, so I just am very excited um, and I hope, uh, and as I continue in this program, um, just hearing more about everything and, and being part of these, these meetings. So I appreciate you all sharing today. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Um, Re uh, Re Rebecca, there, there's a, uh... One of the participants has asked if you could speak more about what students would be involved in in Israel. Yeah, Isai, thank you so much for your question. Um, so there is, we have variety of placements of volunteering. Um, I can give some examples. It can be from youth centers to women's and shelter um, with the older uh, population. Uh, the population itself, it's, it's located in like um, the, the actual program of uh, Rutgers in the summer. It's in a neighborhood in Rishon Lezion. It's a city in the center. And the, the, the neighborhood is, is, is located with a lot of Ethiopians. So you will see a lot of immigrants there. So they one of the population that needs the help uh, the most, I think, uh, in, in Israeli society. So it's from kids up to adults. Uh, Nancy, you can also add from yourself because you've been here in the yeah. past summer. Sure, yeah. Uh, the, the, in the past couple of years, we've had students uh, in school settings, early childhood school settings in youth after school programming and that goes on into early evening sometimes too uh, because the the youth really come to the center and that's that's part of their family that's uh where they connect with their friends and they go on some trips and uh to local uh uh sites uh, so there's some after school, there's a mental health facility uh, where adults with uh, serious mental health issues uh, are engaged in programming. Uh, there's older adult uh, programming at a day elderly day center. Uh, for MAP students, there uh, is an advocacy program that works with uh, immigrants, particularly in the Ethiopian community, that uh, have experienced discrimination either in the school system or in a job or in getting services. So uh, those are some of the programs uh, where students are placed. 
Uh, and then of course, uh, we have excursions that, uh, where we visit different uh, places uh, in Israel that are also social service minded. Uh, we visited uh, a farm and a co-op where that serve uh, uh, women that have been uh, experienced either assault, sexual assault, or domestic violence, or some uh, traumatic event. And uh, so we visited how they work in, in that cooperative farming community. We also visited uh, another uh, domestic violence program where they engage the women in creating crafts and other items to build self-esteem. Uh, we heard a lecture uh, from an expert in, uh, in immigration of different communities. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, that'll, that, that gives you, I hope, uh, gives you a little bit of uh, some examples. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, just to follow up on that. How does the language barrier work uh, when we're in Israel? Yeah, you know, uh, I don't speak uh, Hebrew and most of the program participants don't speak Hebrew uh, from the Rutgers end of it. Um, uh, but we, uh, that's part of the study abroad uh, challenge, right? How do, you, how do we connect with people and move beyond language? And, and Becky, you can also uh, speak to this, uh, Janice and Miladi. Uh, we really, it becomes very, uh, you know, human to human, person to person. They see your expression, they see your interest, they see your smile, they see uh, how you, you look at them in their eyes, you care about who they are. So, uh, and often they are trying to learn English and lingu English language skills is a very high priority for Israelis and for other cultures. And so if you can help them learn a bit of English, a few words here or there, that really enhances their self-esteem and really enhances. So it's, uh, it's the challenge of study abroad and we've been very successful. Yeah. Anyone else want to contribute yeah. to that? Um, Melissa, well, just to say we have some students that have participated in the past um, and Melissa, I see you here, and I know Alex is in the group. You want to say anything, Melissa? Sure. Um, with study abroad in Romania, I spent the month in Romania, and I also do, uh, did the Mexico program. And as Nancy was saying, it's definitely the human interaction, um, sharing meals together, um, doing crafts together. It shared you share that community together and that's how the communication gets established. And then over time um, and repetitiveness, it becomes very easy. Um, even though they don't speak, most likely don't speak English or we don't speak Romanian, it just, the flow is established over a period of time with consistency. Um, you know, immersing yourself within the community and within the culture is extremely important. Um, that's where you get most of the experience. So definitely not um, hiding in your room or anything like that, really being out and present within the society is definitely key to having a full experience. And I definitely highly recommend any of the programs. I wasn't fortunate enough to get to Israel, but <laughs> um, they're great programs. Not too late. No, it's not. <laughs> um, but it's something that I really do cherish and I still have uh, fond memories of and really want to get back there too, so. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, Rebecca, did you want to respond? Um, regarding the language barrier. I 
I will say about my own, when I was young, I had to, you know, my grandma didn't speak Hebrew, but I didn't speak, speak the Ethiopian language. So we did communicate. So I believe that sometimes you need this one person, even by looking at him, uh, you have an eye contact. Uh, like Melissa said, it's about interaction. Uh, so for me, it was like from my own experience, you know, growing up like that, everything is possible. And I think it's more beautiful even when you have this language barrier, because then sometimes you feel more, I don't know, like someone is hugging you completely. Um, there is a different and interesting interaction when language is not there. Mm. So that, this is what I feel, but you can manage to do it. I mean, a lot, a lot of the people, people do speak English, but not all of them. Uh, it's possible. It's, it is possible. That's why we're doing it. Yeah, and you, there's a lot of, I see Alex, you can, thank you. I didn't, I didn't want to uh, put you on the spot, but do you have anything to add? Yeah, I do. Um, thanks, Dr. Davis. Um, so I went to Romania last summer, and I have to say that the language really, um, it wasn't, I mean, the nonverbal, you learn so much about reading nonverbal, um, you know, communication, and a smile is so much, and and you can just tell from body language, um, you know. And and it's 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 incredible to see how much, even though you don't speak the same language, that you still kind of do. Like there's just ways that people say things, like their tone, like you can kind of understand from that, um, you know. And like laughing, I don't know. And and the translators too, like there are people that are in the um, you know, like the supervisors and the internships, like in the in the placements, they do speak English, but you learn how to communicate in a way with them where they're able to translate what you're saying and how to, you know, word things in a way that can be translated. Um, so yeah, I think that the language is really like, it's not a barrier. It's more of um, just like a, a growth experience. Hmm. Thank, thank you. Yeah. The, the, you know, it's, you're doing all kinds of activities um, I've had students that say they never really thought about um, being an art therapist or using art. And through that experience, they learned that they, they learned they had some talents and interests that they could add to their uh, social work, you know, their experience. Um, but it's that value of the human relationship. Um, and Malati, you know, we we spent time with the children in Mexico at one of the children's uh, homes and how quickly those attachments, they did not want to leave. <laughs> yeah, they, the um, formations of those re um, relationships are very quick. And even through the use of music or um, like hand movement and activities, they played games um, and the children and, and sometimes some of the students weren't able to communicate with the language, but it was within 10 minutes like there was just um laughter of the children and um so the language was definitely not an impact in any way it, it kind of creates um, an interest and a curiosity to learn from each other in a different way and so it it kind of it, it is really um because then you need to be a little bit more creative and also um put in all your cues like you you need to think about other uh, it's not about just listening to what they're saying, but you're also looking at the way they're looking, the way they're walking, their way, everything. So you're really looking at all the senses. Um, so it creates a different um, experience. And, you know, we have experience in the U.S. with working with people that we don't speak the same language with. And, and so it's, um, it's very applicable in you know agencies here and I, I i see some comments in the the chat as well um that that speak about the culture of humility and really the opportunity like alex said yeah so, i, I, I want to just add that uh along with your point becky and melody about the uh 
you really see the interaction and the partnership come alive. It's really one helping the other, learning from each other. Uh, the the youth feel really good when they can use their English language skills and or if they teach us a few words in Hebrew that we pronounce incorrectly or correctly and they get a big kick out of this. And uh, so you do see the reciprocity Mm -hmm. really coming alive, the the mutuality and the reciprocity in the relationship building, you really see that aspect come alive. We feel humbled because, right, which we, when we work here, right, we're a little maybe more empowered because we have knowledge, we have expertise, etc. But we really want to bring that humility, that culture, that humility into our work, that we're not the expert on all of this, on the human condition. We have a lot to learn, too, about the human condition. So we have to try harder here in the U.S. to really convey that to our clients. In, in the global setting, it, it really emerges much more organically. I would say. Yeah, Janice, did you want to add anything to? No, nothing to add. It was just um, interesting to hear from those about their experiences in the study abroad program. So thank you for sharing that. Janice, you've, you've traveled, you've lived or studied in other countries. Would, yes. you, would you share with the group your experience? Yeah, um, so I, I actually spoke to Dr. Davis's class yesterday, um, Global Social Work and Social Development, if anyone else has had the opportunity to take that class. Um, but I spoke about my country assessment, which I did on Kenya. Um, and so my study abroad experience was when I was an undergraduate, which was well over a decade ago. Um, but then I subsequently was able to work as a research assistant on a variety of different projects that really came out of that experience of study abroad. Um, and so I, I spoke a little bit about that to Dr. Davis's class yesterday, but I think, um, you know, just to like reiterate that experience of cultural humility, and I think, you know, and how you're able to communicate in ways other than language, I, I just think was such an important part of my educational experience. Um, even though I didn't have that opportunity to do as a social work student, I feel like it ultimately led me to social work in some direct and indirect ways. Um, but that was a Rutgers study abroad program that I did um, in anthropology. Great, thank you. Great. And, and, and that's a good point you make, Janice, about how one experience is just it's not a finite experience. It then becomes, it leads us onto another path and both uh, academically, personally, professionally. And so the experience is in itself a good one, but it's more than just that, that finite time. It really, uh, it gets becomes integrated in our work in so many ways here in the U.S. It becomes into it, it really becomes integrated in our work, and uh, it has it has that a, a great influence in many creating many pathways. So I think that was a great point, Janice. And there was uh, an interest to hear from Alex or Nicole about uh, a day in Romania. What would what would your day look or, like in, uh, while on the Romania program? Or Melissa, it was Melissa that spoke. Oh, Melissa. Okay. Um, and then if there's anybody in the um, anybody out there that did Israel, um, you could also speak. But Alex, if you or Melissa want to just 
talk about a day. <laughs> Um, go ahead, Alex. Okay. <laughs> and then Thanks. I'll go after you because I went before COVID. So, and then you went mm -hmm. recently. Yeah. So go ahead. Um, so that's a good question. I feel like it was always kind of different. Um, you know, at the, so I was at the elderly day center in Romania and that's, um, I mean, so obviously all the clients there are older adults and it was like a community center where they would come and play, um, you know, different kinds of games. Like they had like card games, that kind of thing. And um, they did groups. Um, so we would participate in, in a, like a women's group that they did there. We would have opportunities to lead the group. Um, and then we did activities too. So like a one really fun activity that we did with the clients that we put together was a spa day. And so we bought all different kinds of like face masks, eye masks, all that kind of fun stuff. and. Um, we had snacks like fruit and different kinds of like, you know, treats and drinks. And it was just so much fun. Like we helped them put like the face masks on, we did their nails. Um, and it was just such a great like way to connect. And, and it was, it was awesome too, because the supervisors there did, there were a few that spoke such incredible English. And so they were able to translate for us and the clients would share with us their stories about their childhood, their families. They would show us pictures. They loved showing us pictures. And um, it was just, it was just really fun. I hope that answers the question. And then I think a day in life, like Alex said, it was a little different each day. Um, you would schedule your placements um, according to their needs. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to a couple different ones. Um, I primarily went to the Adult with Disabilities Center um, and worked with the adults there. We did exercise programs. They loved their theater and musical programs, um, did some kinesiology, so exercise um, they had downstairs. And then they also had crafts upstairs. I think they also had um, another like wood shop kind of place also in the facility and out there was outside gardening to be done as well so they have a multitude of different opportunities during the day um, for interaction with the adults and different ideas that we can come up with um, for programming as well so that we change it up a little bit for them or we lead an exercise with them um, and then also I had opportunities to spend time at Autism Transylvania and the uh, Regisita, the after school program for uh, children. Um, and the, the, we did crafts, games, we went into the community all altogether. Um, it, there was a, opportunities to do a lot of things. You schedule out your own lunch um, and dinners. Um, I know when we were there, we did a lot of community um, dinners together on the floor that we stayed in together. So we did a lot of potluck. So just to have that sense of community and able to debrief during the day after having a day out in the community, um, different ideas that were coming up together just to help service our field placements appropriately and also different ideas to for what's out in the community of what different um, programs or events that were happening just so we could all tag along together if we wanted to. Um, so it's a typical day like you would have here, but not typical in a sense either. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I could speak a little bit about the Israel program. Thank you to Alex and Melissa for that description. And uh, uh, Rebecca, you can also help me out here with the, the schedule of activities. So basically in Israel, uh, we have an itinerary pretty much uh, for the week. The, the, work, the work week starts on Sunday and typically students are in uh, their field placement uh, for four days during the week, Sunday through uh, Wednesday or Thursday, depending on the week. And uh, and often there are, just as Melissa mentioned, often there are two placements where students are assigned. 
because let's say if you're assigned to the after school program, well, you have the whole day. So then we assign you to another setting during the daytime where you spend a few hours. So often there's uh, one, or, one or two uh, field placements. And then uh, typically, and that ends around anywhere between three and five o'clock, depending on the schedule of the setting. Uh, and then there is some free time or there is some time for group meals. We at least have one group meal together during the week. Often students are talking to each other about coordinating meals, that kind of thing, shopping, right? All the trips to the grocery store, that's, that's, my, that's my most fun. And uh, that's part of uh, your field hours because it is an immersive experience. We count all those experiences of going to the to the supermarket, to the pharmacy, to the gro you know, the grocery, the local shop to get some items. All of that counts because that's part of your learning, actually. And uh, so we do have uh, regular group supervision as, during the week, at least once. And then there's, of course, individual time. We're talking, we're always walking from one place to the next. It is a lot of walking. And we're always uh, talking about the the setting and what you're doing and what can you what could we do more? What can what can we do differently? Uh, and then we have uh, at least one lecture during the week in the evening time. Uh, and then one day a week is for an excursion like a cultural excursion. Uh, I mentioned a few before we go to Tel Aviv or to Jerusalem. Uh, we go to the north uh, and to we visited some domestic violence communities. So uh, it it varies, but there is some there is some downtime. There is some free time that students have and they you the group modality you will become if you're on these study abroad programs you will become expert group workers because uh everything's happening in the group you really see the power of the group come alive how people connect how people help each other how people uh uh, you know, form uh, friendships. Uh, and so really the, the group, the experience of the group is a big part of, of your learning. I hope that's helpful. Anything you want to add, Rebecca? <laughs> okay. Yes, and uh, yes. Lonnie, uh, you... Becky, yes, you commented about the, the student input. So students have a lot of uh, say in the type of activities uh, that, that they think might fit in right. with uh, the, the structure of their program. Like for one of the, the, the early childhood schools, students developed a dance program, a craft program, an activity program. So it's not just, uh, uh, you have hands-on experience in developing activities. Yeah, and it's that's a learning in and of itself, is what kinds of things, what kinds of activities um, or interventions can I do to reach this particular goal? To um, um, and so really, you know, doing some research, working together with. Usually, the students work together. Uh, you know, two or three might work together doing some things. Um, but but it is it 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 is about. Um, the the direct hands-on work. 
And there's some preparation before before you go. We have pre-departure. We generally we have some meetings with our um, partners, and um, you can't get away from doing your reflection assignments. <laughs> <laughs> Get your reflection assignments done. Um, the learning contract, so the it's, it's structured the very similarly as to the your field your field placements here. Um, yeah, the the summer programs to remain in Israel do count as a full semester of field practicum credits and the cost of the uh, tuition that you would normally pay for the field practicum is embedded in the cost of the program. There is, uh, you know, not all, you know, the program does uh, uh, include uh, airfare that students uh are responsible for and other some meals, uh, but uh, the 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 cost of what you would pay for the field practicum course credit is included in the the cost of the program. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Thank you so much to Victoria for thanking us. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> this is really, I was, uh, you know, really so moved by Rebecca, your, your story, your personal and family story. And I'm so impressed with Becky and Janice, all the curriculum and initiatives you're doing that just took off. That's at the UN, that's and Miladi, the the reach you have to the CPMP and and training and within our child welfare system and abroad, really impressive work. So, uh, you know, these are some of the things that are going on uh, here at the School of Social Work. Uh, this is just a, a little bit of a taste and. Uh, uh, so if any of this sparks your interest, we hope that you'll communicate with us and see what opportunities there are and uh, join, enroll in study abroad programs. And really it, it is a unique, uh, every experience counts. That's what I always tell students. Uh, every interaction with students, with clients count. Uh, every experience that you have, yes, there's some work involved usually. That's just the way life is, right? Uh, but it really reverberates in so many different areas of our lives and uh, going forward, not just in the present. Uh, it really uh, influences our life, just as Rebecca, you, you remember that tutor you had for a couple of yeah. weeks or hours and what an influence that was on your life and that really speaks volumes and, and that's really for everyone to think about because sometimes in the field setting here and abroad uh, there may be mundane tasks or there are concrete tasks and you say well you know I'm really you know I'm not doing much but when we think about the meaning this has for clients or those informal interactions you have with clients, that all has lasting influence. And we have to think of our role as being one in a series of different helping professionals, right? We're not the only one involved in the client's life. Uh, they will have uh, other people involved in their life. And if they can have a good experience with us, they then transfer that positive response to the next person. So uh, 
you really want to find value in whatever interactions you have with people uh, at your field placement. And even if you're doing research and other uh, more macro tasks, you really want to think have value in seeing what the impact that research can have on the clients in, and families on the ground. So, uh, okay, anyone else before we end? Just to, um, just to add that, um, Melody, I was thinking maybe we should add uh, a module on working with girls in the child welfare training curriculum. <laughs> I'm sure that if we bring that up, they, you know, they might be interested. Yeah, they, they do have lots of different topics, and it's really um, also, you know, topics that support the workers because they have such a great impact in the families. They always need that support. So, yeah, Becky, yeah. that's one to always include. Maybe we can include it in there. And yeah, ask. even the, you know, the the topic of menstrual health is you know, really gaining, gaining recognition in the U.S. now in certain places. Um, the other thing, uh, Nancy, just to add in terms of for macro people working in the macro, um, the map area is, it's really an opportunity to learn about how organizations have developed in different countries, including Israel, and even Yahel is a unique um, organization that was started by um, Donna, a social worker, um, and um, in Romania, the same, how the NGOs, non-governmental organizations, we talk about how they um, developed some of the barriers. Um, so that's, another, that's an opportunity to, to learn about uh, that from a, a map perspective. So, Thank you. Anybody else? Janice, Malati, Rebecca? I just saw that there's somebody that's asking for the link to the application. So I just wanted to make sure. Oh, Becca, you may have that. But I, if you just Google Rutgers Study Abroad, that'll take you to the home page. And then you navigate around uh, for the um, Israel and Romania.